The story of Old St Paul's is often told as one of neglect and defeat, as if the cathedral was just too big to adjust to the needs of a reformed church and it was hated by too many Puritans for its ornate fabric and decoration. It's as if the building was only saved the humiliation of falling down because the fire took it just in time. I want to argue here that the Elizabethan St Paul's was a success, that it managed to find a way to work as a cathedral for a Protestant city. Very particular circumstances in the 1640s brought that process grinding to a halt, but even then the old place had more friends than we often suppose. So let's begin by looking at the cathedral and its precinct before the Reformation. The first thing to remember about Old St Paul's is that it was huge. Its orientation was slightly different to the present building and it was a little longer and a little thinner, but its dimensions were not radically different to the current building. It was about 585 feet long, the nave was about 100 feet wide and the transepts measured 290 feet from north to south. The personnel of the cathedral before the Reformation were as follows. It was the Bishop of London, who was not necessarily a regular visitor, although his palace was in the precinct. The cathedral was run by the Dean. There were four archdeacons for the Diocese of London, a treasurer, a precentor, who was the director of music, and a chancellor who dealt with legal matters. There were also 30 major canons, some of whom might take on roles like subdean or sacrist. Many of the major canons were non-resident. In fact, by the Reformation, only four were usually residentiaries. More important to the daily life of the cathedral were the 12 minor canons. In St Paul's, the minor canons were a formally incorporated body with their own statutes and with a hall in the precinct. There were also 12 vicars choral who sang the liturgy. Along with these regular members of the cathedral staff, there were an indefinite number of chantry priests whose job it was to say mass at particular altars. There may have been as many as 52 chantry priests in St Paul's. There were also up to five vergers who served under the sacrist and there were bell ringers. So there was a considerable number of people whose livelihood and home lay within the cathedral precinct. Their day was structured around the seven services that made up the canonical hours, from matins before daybreak to Compline at bedtime. These services were probably sung in the choir. There were also regular masses. The Apostles' Mass was sung in the morning by one of the minor canons and the Mass of the Blessed Virgin came after. On special days, like the two festivals of St Erkenwald and the two feast days of St Paul's, there was great pomp, including bell ringing. And on the church's major feast days, there would be sermons by the bishop or the dean. Since the end of the 13th century, the cathedral had a divinity lecture, a post that Lancelot Andrews would later occupy. These lectures were delivered three days a week in the Lady Chapel behind the high altar. Away from the choir, other services took place. The chantry priests said their masses in the side chapels of the nave. Pilgrims came to the popular shrine of St Erkenwald and we know there was a prayer and a hymn designed to be said at the shrine. The city guilds and the London Corporation had processions to the cathedral and within the building on particular festival days. These processional services were what the nave of the cathedral was for and at other times rather more secular uses dominated that space. The sequest door on the North Isle was the place where those seeking work advertised their availability. Scriveners had assigned themselves places in the nave to set up shops since the early 14th century. Outside the cathedral, there were several other important spaces. The chapter house lay on the south side of the cathedral and on the north side lay the pardon churchyard, which featured a famous dance macabre, and the cross yard where the pulpit known as Paul's Cross stood. From what I've said, one might be tempted to think that not very much changed with the Reformation. Many things in this description seem familiar today. The composition of the chapter stayed the same. The bishop, the dean, the major and the minor canons. Services were still said daily, although an Elizabethan would hear morning and evening prayer rather than the seven offices. The vicar's choral was still there, as was the organ. The chantry priests were gone and communion was celebrated less often. But preaching continued and indeed increased in frequency and esteem. Processions were no longer a liturgical rite, but processions to services did still happen regularly. And there is continuity in the things that 16th and 17th century visitors to the city thought to remark upon when they visited St Paul's. They talked about the steeple, the music and the monuments. The German Thomas Platter, writing in 1599, says, On the morning of September 21st, I went to St Paul's Church, 
where I saw and heard the canons in white surplices and square berettas similar to the popes at home conduct the service in English with music and organ accompaniment just as if they were celebrating mass. I then climbed 300 steps to the church roof which is broad and covered with lead so that one may walk there. Indeed, every Sunday, many men and women strolled together on this roof. Up there, I had a splendid view of the entire city of London, of how long and narrow it is. Another German, Paul Hetzner, noted that St Paul's had a very fine organ, which at evening prayer, accompanied by other instruments, is delightful. But we should not imagine that the cathedral managed the transition from the late medieval to the Reformation church smoothly or easily. Those elements that we still have today had the benefit sometimes of luck, sometimes of planning, and nearly always the support of some powerful and sometimes cunning men and women. For one thing, the fabric of the cathedral suffered very significant damage. The first things to go were the shrines that had been the focus of pilgrimage and the images that were considered idolatrous. In October 1538, an image of St Erkenwald, probably from the shrine, was delivered to the master of the king's jewels. Other images may have survived for a time, a month earlier, when Sir Richard Gresham heard of the campaign against images, he notified the Dean of St Paul's and they removed some images from the church that night. More systematic iconoclasm happened in the reign of Edward VI and we are lucky to have a good source in the so-called Greyfriars Chronicle. A religious conservative, the chronicler reports in a matter-of-fact way about the changes he saw. The statue of the crucifixion, the rood and other images were destroyed in November 1547 and all the altars and chapel in all Paul's church were taken down in October 1552. Copes, richly embroidered ceremonial vestments, were no longer to be used, nor were processions allowed. In 1550, the Dean, William May, ordered that the playing of the organ be discontinued, but the instrument was not taken away. Although Edward's Dean and Bishop were keen reformers, the rest of the chapter and those living in the precinct did not necessarily welcome these changes. In 1552, the new liturgy looked as different as it sounded. Our chronicler reports, On All Holland Day began the book of the new service of bread and wine in Paul's, and the bishop did the service himself and preached in the choir at the morning service and did it in a rochet and nothing else on him. And the dean, with all the residue of the prebends, went but in their surplus and left off the habit of the university. And the bishop preached at afternoon at Paul's Cross and stood there till it was near hand five o'clock. And the mayor and the aldermen came not within Paul's church, nor the crafts as they were wont to do, for because they were so weary of his long standing. For many of those now with responsibility for the cathedral, including the Edwardian Bishop of London, Nicholas Ridley, the cathedral needed to play a very different role if it was to find a place in the new church. We see this attitude in the famous woodcut from John Fox's Book of Martyrs. Objects associated with the Catholic liturgy are shipped away. They are mere paltry. The reformers wanted the cathedral's income to be spent on active preachers and ministers. They wanted the services to have a pastoral function. That was hard to square with a building whose choir screen was designed to exclude the laity. And not everyone thought that there was any advantage, or indeed any virtue, in the things that the cathedral did well. The organ music and elaborate polyphonic singing were disliked by those who favoured simpler metrical psalm singing. Of course, the real grimness of the English Reformation story is that people went through these traumatic changes again. With the accession of Mary Tudor, the processions with copes, the altars and the Latin Mass were back. Some were happy to see these returns, others considered this the worst kind of sinful backsliding. When Mary's first Parliament convened in October 1553, the convocation met at St Paul's and began with the Mass of the Holy Ghost. The Mass was said by Bishop Bonner, standing at the High Altar, which had been reinstated for the occasion. Rather a different story could be told from the cross yard, where conservative preachers were greeted with less enthusiasm. In one of the worst incidents of riot at Paul's Cross, on the 13th of August 1553, Dr Gilbert Bourne, Mary's chaplain, was attacked by the crowd, who were shouting at his sermon as it were mad people, one witness reports. Bourne was pulled out of the pulpit and nearly struck with a dagger. The next week, Dr Thomas Watson, chaplain to the Bishop of Winchester, preached in what was clearly intended to be a show of strength by the government. A troop of 200 men accompanied the preacher to the pulpit and stood around it all through the sermon. Some of those appointed to the cathedral in Edward's reign met a martyr's death, including the Bishop of London, Nicholas Ridley, and the prebendary John Rogers, who had helped Tyndale with his translation of the Bible. By the accession of Queen Elizabeth in November 1558, 
The divisions that were rapidly hardening into permanent Christian denominations were bitter and personal. The cathedral staff was noticeably reluctant to accept the return of the Protestant prayer book service. They did not adopt the new liturgy until the last moment legally possible, the 24th of June 1559. Members of the cathedral chapter were notably absent from the preaching rota at Paul's Cross. The new Bishop of London, Edmund Grindle, tried to insist that the minor canons and the vicar's choral attended the sermon, but we don't know how much success he had. Preachers at Paul's Cross were handpicked by the Bishop of London in consultation with the Privy Council. For the first year or two of Elizabeth's reign, it must have seemed as if those inside and those outside the cathedral were on opposite sides of a deep and hurtful divide. The chapter saw substantial changes of personnel as confessional divisions hardened. As many as 12 prebendaries of the cathedral chapter were deprived at the start of Elizabeth's reign. And then, with spectacularly bad timing, a wholly natural disaster occurred. In 1561, the steeple of the cathedral was struck by lightning and collapsed. Immediate steps were taken to repair the damage, and the citizens of London offered over £3,000 towards the work. The clergy of England and the bishops also contributed, so that in all £6,000 was raised. But the estimated cost of repairing the building properly was over £22,000, an impossibly large sum for a country and a city recovering from a trade depression. Instead, the roof was patched up and a timber roof put on the steeple. This left the transept structurally unsound in the long term. Although intermittent attempts were made by the London Corporation throughout Elizabeth's reign, the steeple remained unfixed. The cathedral could be presented as an unloved and an unlovely building at this time. We know the churchyard became the centre of a vibrant and probably rather noisy book trade, and there are much quoted sources that tell us about irreverent use of the building itself. Walking, jangling, brawling, fighting, bargaining in sermons and service time were common, said Bishop Pilkington, preaching after the lightning strike. But this might also be seen as a process of adaptation. The nave of the cathedral was now in even less regular use as a religious space because processions were fewer. The side chapels where the old chantries had been was bereft of any clear purpose and many had been leased out. In 1597, one of the vergers reported on the use of these side chapels as follows. The dean doth lay his surplice and hood in his chapel sometimes and always puts one off the same there. And the Duke of Lancaster's chapel doth the other residentiaries put on and off their surplice and hoods. The lady chapel is not employed but in the parliament time for the deans and archdeacons to sit in for that time. And St Dunstan's, the Lord Mayor and the Alderman doth every Sunday morning set there before they go on to the sermon. And St George's chapel, John Jackson doth lay out old stone and a lathe. And in the long chapel there is lying old fir poles and other old lumber which were laid there after the mending of the church when it was burned, as I've heard. And St Catherine, Mr Mansfield doth teach the children in. And morning prayer is said every morning by one of the petty canons in the same chapel. There was also many successful adaptations to the changes that the new liturgy brought. Between 1598 and 1636, the number of sermons preached each week in the cathedral rose, and we know from sermon note-takers that they were popular with the Londoners. We can also see that the London Corporation and the Gillsmen adapted their civic rituals so that they might continue. The Liber Albus, compiled in 1410, tells us that on the designated feast days when the corporation attends St Paul's, the Lord Mayor meets the aldermen and the liverymen and they process to St Paul's, where, upon arriving there, at a spot namely in the middle of the nave of the church, between the two small doors, it was the custom to pray for the soul of Bishop William, who by his entreaties, it is said, obtained from his Lordship William the Conqueror great liberties for the City of London, the priest repeating the De Profundis. Then they moved on to the churchyard, where lie the bodies of the parents of Thomas, late Archbishop of Canterbury. And there they also repeat the De Profundis, in behalf of all the faithful of God departed, near the grave of his parents, before mentioned. In his Ecclesia Sancti Pauli Illustrata of 1633, Henry Holland tells us that still every year the Lord Mayor and Aldermen upon the same day do walk as far as the said monument, using the same kind of ceremony thereat, but the Popish order is quite abolished. So the custom was retained with necessary adaptation. There were no prayers for the dead at the now demolished Beckett Chapel and evening prayer and a sermon were said instead of Vespers and Compline. But the corporation still wore their civic robes. They processed to and around the church and they were formally greeted at the choir steps by the Dean.
Although the massive structural problems caused by the steeple were not addressed, significant benefactions were made to the church. William Parker, merchant tailor, gave £500 for new stained glass, and the same was to be done in rich coloured glass with effigies and holy stories as it had formerly been glazed and adorned. The first of these windows was put in in 1618 and three were ready for the king to inspect when he visited in 1620. In the 1630s, when Charles I commissioned Inigo Jones to undertake a large-scale renovation of the church, an opportunity for more significant repairs presented itself. Scaffold was erected at the crossing to repair the damage caused by the steeple's collapse. William Dugdale notes some spectacular contributions to this project. Sir Paul Pinder gave a whopping £10,000 to the cathedral in 1630. This paid for the refitting of the choir and repairing of the choir screen. He also paid for considerable repairs to the south transept. But again, the unpredictability of history moved against the old building's best interests. No real consensus had ever emerged about some ongoing controversies, including the use of statues and images in churches. The elaborate decorations paid for by Pinder with gilded angels in the choir screen were not universally welcomed. When the political momentum in the city shifted from the Laudians to the Puritans, St Paul's suffered their iconoclastic retribution. In December 1643, a group of aldermen were ordered to assist Robert Harlow and anyone else appointed by the House of Commons for and concerning the removal of all such things out of their Church of Paul's as may be found by them to be offensive. But the same delegation of aldermen undertook to review the defects and rottenness of the scaffolds in and about the said church and to recover the funds raised for repairing it. So the iconoclasm was matched with a concern for the building itself. But the effect of the war was felt. In 1653, the scaffolding around the crossing was removed and sold. And in 1654, the roof of the South Transept Vault collapsed. The community that maintained the cathedral's life was also broken up when Episcopacy and the Dean and Chapter were abolished in 1642. But the choir continued to be used for sermons and the Lord Mayor and the Aldermen continued to attend sermons on a Sunday in their official capacity. In 1660, the Cathedral Chapter was successfully reinstated and it still thrives. The building of Old St Paul's went up in smoke as we know, but as we also know, St Paul's would be rebuilt because there was financial support and political will to do that. And so we can see that the evolution of the cathedral through the Long Reformation is a story partly of the most extraordinary historical accidents. But it is also the story of men and women who valued the building and the work done here. And what survived iconoclasm, neglect and fire was a sense that this building represented an idea of corporate worship and community. So I will close with the words of one of the cathedral's deans. In a sermon preached in the cathedral's choir, John Donne talks about his preben psalms, the psalms that it was his duty to say every day as prebendary of Chiswick. I have had occasion to tell you more than once before that our predecessors in the institution of the service of this church have declared such a reverence and such a devotion to this particular book of scripture, the psalms, as that by distributing the 150 psalms, of which number the body of this book consists, into 30 portions, of which number the body of this church consists, and assigning to every one of those 30 persons his five psalms, to be said by him every day, every day God receives from us, howsoever we be divided from one another in place, the sacrifice of praise in the whole book of the psalms. And though we may be absent from this choir, yet wheresoever dispersed, we make up a choir in this service of saying over all the psalms every day. <laughs>